Well, I tell you, it's hard to preach after that, but I'm going to. <laughs> I got some things I want to share with you. Of course, everything is based on faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. But did you know faith, we've complicated it, just as, as this was saying. It, it, you know, faith is a noun. I don't know if any of you ever thought of this. But faith is a noun. Belief is a verb. A noun is something. A verb is an action. Faith isn't something that we have to do. It's what we have. When you get born again, you are given faith. You couldn't get born again without it. It's a gift of God. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You could say that salvation is not of yourself, and that's accurate, but I believe that it's saying that that faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did you know when you got born again, God had to give you His supernatural faith in order for you to believe. You couldn't get born again with a human faith. A human faith is limited to what it can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. It's based on your five senses. And yet when you get born again, you aren't, you're believing for something that you can't see. You've never seen God. You've never seen the devil. You've never seen heaven. You've never seen hell. You're believing that your sins are forgiven, and yet you didn't see Jesus die. You know what you're doing? You are taking the word that was given to you, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So someone shared with you truth and that truth contained God's faith. God's word contains his faith and you heard and you believed, you received it. And did you know that the faith of God doesn't come and go? Your, your ability to function in it may come and go depending on what you're focused on. If you're focused on the negatives, well, then that's what's going to dominate you. But you can focus on the Word of God and to the degree that you keep your heart focused on the Word of God, that same faith that you received at salvation is still there. It never comes and goes. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 22, it says, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those things are in your spirit 24 hours a day, constantly. You are never without faith. You have faith. It is a possession of every believer. It's just a matter of are you going to believe? Are you going to operate in the faith that God has given you? I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but this, is, this was really revelation to me because when I really got turned on to the Lord, I didn't have any doubt that faith worked. And I'd heard testimonies. We've heard a lot of testimonies this week of faith and how it worked. And I didn't doubt that faith worked. I didn't doubt that God could do things. I just wasn't sure that He'd do it for me. I wasn't sure that I had enough faith. But when I realized that faith was given to me at salvation and what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, they acted this out about the demonic boy that was brought to Jesus and the uh, father of the child said, you know, I believe, help my unbelief. And uh, Jesus cast that demon out of that boy. And as you uh, go through the story... Matthew chapter 17, the disciples says, why couldn't we cast him out? They tried to cast him out and they couldn't do it. And Jesus didn't say it was because, it, he did not say it was because you didn't have enough faith. He said it's because of your unbelief. You've got faith. If you're born again, you've got enough faith. And Jesus in that context, he says, verily I say unto you, if you say unto this mountain, or excuse me, that was in uh, Mark chapter 11. But he said here, if you say to this sycamine tree, be cast into the sea, it'll obey you. Faith isn't the problem. We've got faith. The problem is our unbelief. And unbelief is just not acting on the faith that we've got. Instead, it's looking at things. You know, today, Johan talked about that. If you were here to hear Johan and then uh, Lenny and uh, Allison talked about this same thing. They, they just believed and they got to a place to where it didn't care what they saw. It didn't matter what they felt. 
Allison was saying that she doesn't even remember when her hair grew back. She just knew that she was healed and it was coming and so she didn't worry about it. See, that's what faith is. You have faith and the key isn't that you got to get more faith. It isn't that you got to get God do something special. So many people are saying, oh God, give us more faith. Give us more faith. You don't need more faith. What you need is less unbelief. And faith is basically just you focusing on what God has already done. As this also portrayed, it says in Galatians 5, 6, that faith works by love. If you focus on how much God loves you, and if you just think about that, if that's all you considered, if all you did was think about how much God loved you, if you didn't think about what the doctor said, if you didn't think about your friend who also died of the same thing that you've got, if you weren't so plugged into the world that you were constantly hearing doubt and unbelief. I tell you, our society, we are baptized in doubt and unbelief. The things that I'm saying right now, this is a, a different crowd. You came here because you do believe, because you do have faith. But if I was in the secular market today saying these things, I guarantee you people would stand up and criticize me and rebuke me. People would criticize you for believing the Word of God. We live in a society that is anti-faith, that is just full and baptized in unbelief. Even our churches are full of unbelief. There's many churches that would fight against what we're doing here and saying that God doesn't heal today. It's not a faith problem. You have more than enough faith. If you got born again, you got more than enough faith to get up out of a wheelchair, to see blind eyes open, deaf ears open, to see cancer healed. Faith isn't the problem. It's our unbelief, the fact that we are so plugged into the world that we have exalted the word of a doctor or a lawyer or a banker more than we exalt the word of God. Unbelief is our problem. That's what Jesus was teaching his disciples. And so what we've got to do is just focus on God and on his love. Again, it was portrayed in this musical that we saw that when the centurion said, when he understood that God loved him, that's when he was able to believe. You know, I've had people before that I've tried to minister healing to. I can think of one person in particular. He was in the hospital and they said he wouldn't live through the night and he lived for an entire week and he just seemed to be hanging on. And so they finally said, you can go home and die. There was nothing they could do for him. And so he rented an ambulance. He was in New Mexico and came all the way back to Colorado. And when he got to Colorado, his wife called me and put the phone up to his ear because he couldn't even hold the phone. He was just about dead. And they uh, asked me to pray. And I told him, don't you dare die until I get there. And I drove up to his place in Crystal Park down by Colorado Springs, and I started ministering to him. And, and every day for a month and a half, I would go over and see him and just speak faith into him. And this guy got to where he couldn't even hold a phone. He couldn't sit up. He was, he was not eating. He got to where he was eating. He was walking around. He was driving a car. And one of the things, and he, he did eventually die, and it turned out at his funeral uh, you know, it was about two months. He got to where he was walking and doing everything. And then all of a sudden he just died. And it threw us for a loop for a while. But I told people, I said, look, it wasn't God that failed. I don't know what happened, but God's not the one who failed. And at his memorial service, his wife read in his diary. And about a month into this process, he was getting stronger every day. And he just wrote in his diary. He says, you know what? I'm 70 something years old. I know I'm getting better, but man, I'm ready to go. And he said, I'm going to die because I'm ready to meet Jesus, but nobody will understand it. So I'm going to go ahead and act like I'm believing God. But <laughs> at his funeral, he told, he told everybody, he says, I'm ready to go. And so it explained what happened. But anyway, one of the things that turned him around and that he got so much better was that he was sitting there and said, but I'm old. Oh, I don't know if God wants to heal me. He says, I've lived a full life. And his wife was kneeling beside him at the bed. And I remember just looking at him and I said, do you think your wife would want you to be like this? I said, if she had the power to heal you, do you think that she would just sit there and let you suffer? And this guy nearly got mad at me. No way. She would do anything for me. And I said, and you think God loves you less than your wife? And it just shut his mouth. 
He says, man, we say that God loves us, but the truth is we've been taught that God puts sickness on us to punish us. We put sickness on us to teach us something or to do things like that, but that is not true. God loves you, and if you could just focus on how much He loved you. You know, a real simple passage of Scripture that has made a major impact on my life is Colossians 2, 6. And it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. And the next verse says, Being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you, and abounding therein as, with thanksgiving. I messed that up. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. This says in the same way that you receive salvation is the same way that you receive everything else. How did you receive salvation? You didn't have to earn it. You didn't have to be holy for it. As a matter of fact, most of us were not living for God at all. Some of us were out... Man committing adultery, lying, stealing, smoking, drinking, doing dope, doing whatever. And here you receive the greatest miracle that you could ever receive, which is forgiveness of sins. And you didn't have any goodness to your account. And yet you receive salvation. Why? Because you didn't put any faith in yourself. I've actually had people come before for salvation. And God gave me a word of knowledge one time about a person committing adultery and that you were living in adultery. And instead of this person saying, oh, now I know that God won't save me. Because he understood the gospel, he says, that's the reason I need salvation. Your sin didn't disqualify you from salvation. It actually qualified you. That's what made you a candidate if you were a mess. The only people that God can't save is people who will not admit their need for salvation. And they think that they can save themselves. The scripture said in Romans chapter 4, I believe it's verse 5, that Jesus died for the ungodly. Unless you're willing to admit you're ungodly, you can't be saved. So sin didn't keep you from being saved. And it says, as you have received the Lord, so walk ye in Him. If sin didn't keep you from being saved, sin won't keep you from being healed. And you hadn't been fasting and praying and going to church and paying your tithes before you got born again. You didn't have any great credit to your life. And yet now, here that we are born again, we, we think, well, I, I don't understand why God hadn't healed me, but it's probably because I haven't fasted, I haven't prayed, I haven't done enough. Man, that didn't keep you from getting saved. It won't keep you from getting healed unless you take your eyes off of Jesus and His great love for you and start looking at yourself and thinking that somehow or another you have to qualify and be worthy. See, it's not the fact that we don't have faith. Again, you receive faith when you got born again. You've got more than enough faith to raise the dead. You got raising from the dead faith on the inside of you. Matter of fact, a passage of scripture that I think it was Kerry used today is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, where he prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may see, you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And then the next verse says, according as His divine power has... Excuse me, that's Second Peter. <laughs> but that's a good one too. But this one says, <laughs> what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. He's praying that your eyes would be open to the power that you have. It's the resurrection power of Jesus. That's what you got saved with. God didn't just use a little bit of power to get you saved. And now that you need to be healed, you got to have more power. The same power that, that caused salvation in you heals your body, raises the dead, causes your blind eyes to be opened. You got more than enough faith. You do not have a faith problem. You got an unbelief problem because we haven't been focused on our faith. And our religious teaching has taught us that you got to be worthy. You got to earn it. That's not how you got saved. We're supposed to walk by the same rule. The same way that we receive salvation is the same way we receive everything else. You just believed. I've had people come forward for salvation and I prayed with them and I said, I believe you're saved. And they said, well, I hope so. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Doesn't the scripture say that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9. And they say, well, yeah. I said, did you, are you a whosoever? 
Well, yes. Did you do this? Well, yes. Are you saved? Well, I don't know. And I'll go back through it again. Are you a whosoever? Yes. Did you do this? Yes. Do you believe God lied? Well, no. Well, then are you saved? Well, I guess I am. And they just have to believe by faith, not because they feel it. Did you know most of us, when you got born again, you didn't have an epiphany. You didn't have something dramatic happen. I got born again when I was eight years old. The very first time that God nailed me over sin. I'm not saying it's the first time I sinned. But the first time that I really knew that I had sinned against God. Not just my parents or disobeyed some. I mean, I was convicted over something that I did. And our Baptist pe preacher uh, preached a message on uh, who's who in hell was the name of it. And he went through a thing and started naming names and showing that there were good people, people that I had heard of, people that were famous, who were in hell. And then there was, there was bad people who were in heaven. Good people don't go to heaven, and bad people don't go to hell. It's only people that didn't accept forgiveness that go to hell. And it's only people who accept salvation that go to heaven. And when I heard that, man, I didn't respond in that morning service, but I went home and I asked my dad about this and he explained salvation to me and I got born again in my hotel room. And I was under extreme conviction as an eight-year-old. I knew I was headed to hell. Did you know there's some of you, well, what could you have done? The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. There isn't a hell number two or a hell number three. Some people think that, well, this person is a good person, so certainly they're going to go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you may be good compared to me or good compared to somebody else, but there's not a single person that will ever get into heaven based on your own goodness until you come to a place that you realize you are going to split hell wide open unless Jesus... Uh, his salvation works for you, well, then you can't get saved. You don't get saved by going to church. You can sit in a church and it doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage and make you a car. You got to be born again. Amen. And anyway, I realized this and I was under extreme conviction. And you know what? When I prayed, all of a sudden I didn't have lightning flash. I just felt peace. It was like all of my fear and stuff was gone. And I remember, eight years old, I remember just having a peace come over me and I went out and played outside. And it was the next day when I went to school, my friends could tell something had happened to me. They said, what happened to you? Eight years old, they could tell I was different. And I told them I got saved and I remember my friends making fun of me. But see, you, most of us didn't have some life-altering thing. Many of us, we just prayed and by faith accepted that we were born again because the Scripture promised that you didn't have a feeling, you didn't have a goose bump, you didn't see an angel or any of those things. You just believed. Well, again, Colossians 2, 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walking in Him. So that's the same way you receive healing. You just believe that by His stripes you are healed and then you get to a place that, I, you know, it really doesn't matter if I see it or not. Now, there's a balance to this because you can become so complacent you don't do anything. That's not what I'm talking about. But you get to where you aren't focused on yourself. You aren't looking at things. If that's the way it would have been when you prayed for salvation, you would have thought, well, I'm not saved. Some of you, if you were a smoker, you didn't get instantly delivered. Some people do, but I mean, most people, you get delivered and then it's through the renewing of your mind and it's a process that you get over uh, using profanity and doing different things. But if, if you were just going by what you saw, some of you think, well, I'm not sure I'm saved because you couldn't see it, you couldn't feel it. You go look in a mirror and you feel the same way and yet you just believed that you're saved. And over a period of time, you can see the change that begins to come to pass and you've become uh, You've become secure in your salvation. Did you know receiving healing is the same thing? Jesus has already healed you. His word says, by his stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, if you were healed, you are healed. 
For by grace are you saved through faith. That faith came from God when you heard truth. Faith came through hearing. And faith is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You have faith on the inside of you. It's just a matter of are you going to trust in what you have in Christ? Are you going to believe that? Or are you going to focus on your body? Are you going to focus on the pain? Are you going to focus on what the doctor says? You can literally get to a place to where it just doesn't matter. You know, I heard a story one time about a woman who went to a conference like this and she had a huge goiter on her neck. And so she went down and asked the people to pray for her and they prayed for her. And man, she knew that she was healed. She instantly got up in front of the people and said, I am healed. And yet here's this huge goiter. And yet people understand just like Jesus spoke to the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 it was dead immediately from the roots, but it took about 24 hours for what happened below the surface to become visible above the surface. And so most Christians will give it a little bit of time. And so everybody rejoiced. Here was this woman testifying that she was healed of her gorder, and so they rejoiced. But then the next year at that conference, she came back and she stood up and said, man, tonight is my one year anniversary of the night that God healed me. And yet she still had this huge goiter. Everybody could see it. And people thought, this is strange. But they didn't say anything. Then the second year she came back. And here she was still with the goiter. And she got up and testified, two years ago tonight is when God healed me of my goiter. And people were bothered by that. And they went to the leadership and said, now you, you can't have this woman uh, testifying anymore because she's saying she's healed and anybody can tell she's not healed. And so they approached this woman and said, you can't testify anymore until you see that thing gone. And so she went to the Lord that night and she says, God, I know you healed me, but these people can't believe anything that they can't see. And she said, would you please take this thing away so that they could understand that I was healed two years ago. And so the next day she got up and the goiter's totally gone. And she got up and testified and said, I told you I was healed. That's the way you got to get. That's the way you receive salvation. You prayed for salvation and some of you were an absolute mess. And I guarantee you the next morning you weren't a saint. You were in your spirit, but your body was not... Manifest. It took a while for what God has done on the inside of you to manifest on the outside. Did you know it's the same thing with healing? It's as simple as, are you going to believe what the Word says? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you believed and you ignored and, and rejected anything that you saw in the natural and you went by what God's Word said. Healing is just as simple as that. The Bible says, by stripes you're healed. Now, do you believe that or are you going to wait until you can feel it, until you can see it, until a doctor can verify it? If you are, I love you and God loves you, but what, that's what the Bible calls carnal. Carnal doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're a terrible sinner. The word carnal means of the five senses. You're just dominated by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And again, most of us are more dominated by what we see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, our five senses, than we are by what God's Word said. And that is the reason that you don't see healing. Well, I never made it to that verse I was going to start with. Look at this in Matthew chapter 17. This is Matthew chapter 17 where Jesus cast the demon out of that boy who is the Bible here. King James calls it a lunatic. It was some type of a seizure. And um, Jesus cast the demon out. And then the disciples came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do this? You need to recognize the context that in the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus called his disciples together. And in verse 1, he gave them power over all sickness, over all diseases, and over all demons to cast them out. All of it, not part of it, all of it. And he even said in Matthew 10, 8, go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely you have received, freely give. So he commanded us to heal the sick. I talked about that the other day about the authority that God has given us. And so these people had already been given authority and they went out and preached 
And it says, they came back rejoicing and saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. So these weren't novices. These weren't people who had never seen a person healed before. They had seen miracles. They had seen demons cast out. So that's the context. And this time they did the exact same thing that they had done before, and yet they didn't see the right results. And so because of it, after this boy was delivered, well, then they came and they said, why couldn't we cast him out? So that's important. These were people who had already done it, and yet this time it didn't work. Why? And here's Jesus' answer. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. I mentioned this the other day, but the NIV says it's because of your little faith. That's not true. Because the rest of this verse makes no sentence if you think that they just needed more faith, because he goes on to say, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So the point that he's making is you don't need a huge faith. You just need a mustard seed amount of faith. You don't have to have big faith. Did you know these disciples, Peter walked on the water, and yet Peter's the one that just a short time before this, you know, he turned around and rebuked Jesus for saying that he was going to die. And Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, in just a short period of time, here's Peter walking on the water. It's not like he was a faith giant. There's a reason that those disciples were called disciples. Man, they, you know... Jesus said, where I'm going, you know, and the way, you know, John chapter 14. And they say, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and it'll satisfy. He just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, show us the Father. <laughs> These weren't faith giants. And so Jesus said, it's your unbelief that's the problem. And then look at this in the next verse. You know, like I said, the NIV says it's your little faith. No, it was your unbelief that was the problem. And in verse uh, 21, the NIV doesn't even put that verse in the Bible. If you got an NIV, go look it up. It's not there. There's six verses that they just chose not to put in the Bible for whatever reason. You ought to get yourself a real Bible. Amen. I'm not against the NIV. I quote it. I use it, but I don't trust everything in there. So anyway, in verse 21, he says, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. That has traditionally been, been interpreted as the only way to get certain kind of demons out is through prayer and fasting. That's not what it's talking about. The subject of the sentence is unbelief. This kind of unbelief only goes out through prayer and fasting. What does prayer and fasting have to do with unbelief? And again, I can go into a lot greater detail. I've got this in much more detail in a series that I've got entitled Hardness of Heart. But real quickly, I've put unbelief into three different groups. I can't show you a scripture that says this, but this is just my study of the Word of God. There's unbelief that comes through ignorance. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And if you don't know what the Word of God says, you aren't going to have faith. You've got to know truth in order to receive faith. And so if you're ignorant or if you want to be more politically correct and, and kind, if you don't understand, well, then you hadn't got a chance to operate in faith. You're going to automatically have unbelief. So that kind of unbelief, the way you deal with it is to tell a person the truth. And when the truth comes to them, if they receive it, well, then they overcome that type of unbelief. There's a second type of unbelief that I call wrong teaching. In other words, a person who doesn't know the truth, they aren't going to be able to operate in faith. But a person who has been taught wrong is harder to get to than a person who knows nothing. It's like if you had a blackboard or a whiteboard up here. And if, if you have nothing written on it, well, then it's easy to write something on it. And share the truth. But if a person has been taught all wrong, you're going to have to erase something before you can put the truth in there. 
And we've been taught that God doesn't heal today or that He doesn't heal every time or that He's actually giving you this sickness to be a blessing. He's trying to teach you something. All of those things are lies. They're all wrong, that you've got to be worthy to receive. If you've been taught those things, we've got to erase those things. You've got to overcome that before you can write the truth on. But did you know that the answer to both of those conditions is still the same thing? It's the truth that makes you free. If you're ignorant, tell a person the truth. If you have been taught the wrong thing, tell a person the truth. And if they'll receive it, well, then they'll overcome that type of unbelief. But then there's a third type of unbelief that I call natural unbelief. It's not because you're ignorant and it's not because you've been taught wrong. It's just that you've got five senses that we've all been trained to believe what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. We've been taught that you're absolutely crazy if you see something and say, no, like this woman that had the goiter. Most people would think she's crazy. How can you believe you're healed when anybody can see that you still got the problem? People with natural type of unbelief and are controlled by what they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, and that's more real to you than what the Word of God says. The only way to overcome that type of unbelief is through prayer and fasting. And the reason prayer and fasting affects that is because when you're praying, if you pray not religiously, going through a rosary, are just repeating the Lord's Prayer over as a mantra. But if you are truly in communion and praying and talking to God, if you have a relationship with God, well, then you're talking to a person that you can't see. You're hearing a person that you can't hear. You're operating beyond your five senses. You're operating out of the Spirit. You're operating in what the Bible calls faith. And if you are a prayer person, that spends time in the presence of God, you will train your senses that there's more than what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Prayer, if you do it properly, if you spend time in the presence of God, your senses will recognize that there's more than just what I can see. You know, right now I'm using a wireless microphone. You can't see the signal, but I guarantee you this little pack that I've got is sending a signal back there and they're receiving it and broadcasting it. There are things going on in this room that you can't see. There's television signals in this room. There's radio signals in this room. Likewise, there's angels in this room. There's demons in this room. Somebody said, oh, no demons. We pled the blood. No demons can get in here. Did you know at the Last Supper, Satan entered into Judas at the Last Supper? If the, if the devil was present at the Last Supper, I guarantee you there's demons in here. If I could somehow or another keep all the demons from coming into this room, we wouldn't have near as many people in this room. I'm not saying that to criticize anybody, but sickness is demonic. Depression is demonic. Fear is demonic. The anger that some of you feel towards me is demonic. Galatians 4, 16 says, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? There's things in this room that you can't see, but they do exist. And in the physical realm, you can prove that there are television signals in this room by just taking a TV set and plugging it in, turning it on. And, turn, and did you know when you start seeing a signal is not when the signal comes. The signal's already here. You just can't perceive it. There are things that you cannot perceive with your peanut brain. I know that this shocks some people. Most people, well, if I can't see it, if I can't feel it, well, then God hadn't done anything. You carnal thing. Even in the natural, you know there's things that you can't see and perceive. And in the spiritual, I guarantee you, there's all kinds of things going on. In the spiritual realm... God has already healed you. You've got resurrection power living on the inside of you. And when you got born again, you've got the faith to believe and receive that. If you could just get beyond what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, if you could get out of the carnal realm, out of the flesh, and into the Spirit, and just walk in the Spirit. In the Spirit, you're already healed. In the Spirit, you've already got it. And all you got to do is just stay focused on that. How do you do that? Well, prayer is one of the things that you just start praying and you, 
You start worshiping the Lord based on what the Word says. You have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. John chapter 8, verse 32. And the Word, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So how do you worship God in spirit? You worship Him in the Word. You worship Him based on what the Word says, not what you feel, not what you see, not what you taste and hear. What does the Word say? Many people know that by His stripes I was healed. Well, I know what the Word says, but this is what I feel. You're carnal. And they that are in the flesh, Romans chapter 8, I believe it's verse 6 or 7, cannot please God. The flesh is enmity against the things of God. If you are going to be dominated by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, you aren't going to see healing manifest because you, don't, you are tying your belief to what your five senses. There's more than just your five senses. This is how you got saved, was by believing what the Word said, not what you felt. You didn't see something, you just trusted it. And that same faith that you use for salvation is present on the inside of every single one of us. And we can, in, the like, in like manner, the same way as you got born again, you can just sit there and say, Father... I ultimately need to feel something. I need this tumor to go. I need my eyes to open or whatever. But you know what? I'm not waiting on these physical things before I believe. I believe just like your word says. I believe I receive when I pray. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Shell is future tense. Believe you pray, you receive when you pray. That's present right now. How can you believe that you receive now when you can't see it? You have to operate in faith. You have to get out of your sense knowledge and you have to stand in what the Word of God says. And you have to believe that you receive. You know, some of you are aware that I, I, I went golfing in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I got sunburned real bad, and I got this big old black blister on my ear here, and after a month or two, I got tired of seeing it, and so I just ripped the thing off thinking it would heal. It didn't heal, and it got worse, and I, I didn't go to a doctor, but I have a doctor on my board, and I had other doctors that when I administered, this thing got bad. It, it was, ang my son said, that's angry looking. And uh, it grew and it was bleeding. It would drip on my shirt and stuff. And it bothered other people, but I didn't have to look at it. <laughs> I can't see my ear. I have to go look in a mirror and make an effort. And so I just believe that I received when I prayed. And it took six years. I, it shouldn't have taken six years. I'm sure part of the reason it took six years is because I just honestly didn't care. But I had this doctor on my board say that's a melanoma. I had people tell me that it was a cancer. I never got it verified, but I just didn't care. And I, I was healed. It never bothered me. It bothered everybody else, but it didn't bother me. And my ears healed. I don't have any problems. It's totally normal. It, if I had time, I wish I had time, I don't have time, but if I had time, I could go into telling you how to shorten the time in between when you believe and when you see it. That's up to you. There are things you can do to shorten the manifestation period of time. And I've got an entire, I've got an entire teaching entitled, What to Do When Your Prayers Seem Unanswered. And you are the one that control the manifestation period of time. You can make healing happen. You know, I hesitate to even say this because uh, it puts me in a place I don't want to be. But when the Lord first showed me these things about how to shorten the manifestation period of time, I would pray with people for as long as it took to see a physical manifestation. And I prayed with a lot of people four hours, five hours or whatever. And I saw blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I'd pray and I wouldn't see things immediately, but I would just keep at it and I can make things manifest. I can make a healing manifest. I hesitate to say that because people will immediately want me to start praying for you and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave. As soon as this service is over, I'm going to leave because everybody's going to come and want me to pray for you and I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. I used to stay up until 2 or 3 o'clock every, every night 
praying for people. And it's not that I mind doing it, but I actually in Florida, I remember a woman who was in a wheelchair and we'd already had three or four people come out of a wheelchair that night because I would just stay with them for 20 and 30 minutes. I had one woman who had multiple sclerosis and I prayed with her for 30 minutes and within 30 minutes she was running. I can make a healing manifest it's because it's not me making God. I don't make God do anything. God's already healed everybody. And if you aren't seeing the manifestation, it's not God who's not giving it. It's us that's not receiving it. And most, of, there's a lot of things, but most of it is because we are so looking with our physical senses and wanting to see something in the natural. And that unbelief stops the power of God from flowing. So anyway, I, I hesitate to say those things because I don't want people to look to me. I'm just trying to use it to illustrate that you can overcome these senses. How do you do it? Jesus said through prayer and fasting. The reason fasting affects unbelief. It doesn't affect the devil. Fasting doesn't affect God. God doesn't love you more if you fast. He doesn't love you less if you don't fast. But if you don't fast, you won't love God as much. It's, and it's not going without food only. We talked about this in our panel discussion, I think it was yesterday, that you can fast all kinds of things. You can fast from social media. You can fast from your phone. This is where we're getting, we just pay big bucks to get unbelief piped into us. 24 hours a day, you pay hundreds of dollars to have adultery and lying and stealing and, and the false prophecy that most people call news to be pumped into your house. And we just, I've seen reports that the average person spends four to five hours a day on your phone. And I guarantee you it's not calling people. It's reading all of the bad news and stuff. You can fast that. But fasting, the reason fasting, it affects you. It doesn't affect God. Fasting unplugs you from this world. One of the easiest of your five senses to aggravate is your appetite. Did you know some of you that haven't fasted, I don't think fasting is real popular with most people. You can tell that by just turning sideways and looking in a mirror. <laughs> but if you haven't fasted, there's some of you that if you miss a meal, I mean, your body goes to hurting. If you were to go on a fast by lunch the first day, you feel like you're dying. You got a headache. You didn't have your coffee in the morning. And man, you can't even get out of bed. You can't function without coffee. Did you know all you'd have to do, you don't have to go without food. Just go without your morning coffee. And some of you, it would deny your flesh. Your flesh would go to screaming. You would go to griping and complaining. It's easy to aggravate your appetite. And so the real purpose of a fast, it doesn't give you more pull with God, but what it does for you to persist in a fast, you got to unplug from the world. You've got to unplug from all of this doubt and unbelief, and you've got to focus your attention on the Lord. As Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And if you are going to start denying your flesh, your flesh is going to start screaming at you. And if you persist, you're going to have to say, flesh, I don't care what you say. I don't care how hungry I get. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So fasting isn't only doing without something, but it's replacing that with focusing on God. So instead of, you know, just not eating and sitting down and watching as the stomach turns on television, <laughs> instead you take that time you would have spent eating and preparing eating and you focus on God and you focus your attention. And the more you focus on God, I guarantee you, your flesh is going to rebel. If you are a carnal person, if, if carnal knowledge, what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel dominates you, I can guarantee you, you go on a fast and your body is going to rebel big time. Big time. And you'll feel like you're dying. And so you say, flesh, get in line. I'm going to fast all day long. And your flesh will say, I'll be dead by supper. I'll never make it. And so you tell your flesh, all right, I'm going to go two days. 
instead of one day in your flesh. I, I can't survive two days. It'll go to griping and complaining. You say three days and your flesh will learn that if I'm going to survive this, I better shut up. <laughs> and did you know after, for, if you haven't fasted, did you know with usually within three to four days on a fast, you hit a place to where it just, your hunger goes. You don't care if you ever eat again. Now that's not right. You do have to eat. Fasting needs to be done in a proper way. But you can get to a place to where you break that appetite over you. And then when you tell your body, body pain in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. It'll obey. But if you don't do that, your flesh will say, who are you to tell me what to do? I tell you what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. It's been 20 years since you told me what to do. I control you and your body will rebel and you'll still have your flesh, your pain dominate you. But you can bring your body under subjection. You can get your body to when you say, body, you are healed. It'll say, yes, sir. <laughs> it says this in Hebrews chapter 5, strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil by reason of use. That's talking about like exercise. It's not just something you do one time. It needs to be a lifestyle, a lifestyle of fasting. You know, I'll fast once every, I don't know, three months, four months, and that's usually just a day or two at a time because Jesus has already provided everything and it's more resting in him than it is me doing things. But I live a fasted lifestyle. There's things I fast from constantly. Fasting needs to be a lifestyle where you deny yourself. You don't just sit there and plug yourself into the world six hours a day every day and then go to church one hour a week and think, why is it I'm struggling? It's because of all the unbelief that you've got. You need to be focused on the Lord. The scripture says the just live by faith. They don't vacation there. They don't visit there. They don't go there one hour a week. This is where they live. You need to live by faith. And fasting and prayer will focus your attention on God if you do it correctly. You can do it religiously and all you'll do is get hungry. But if you do it properly, it'll focus your attention on God. If you pray properly, you'll get to where you are receiving the love of God and you are so controlled by the love of God that you don't go by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And that's the way that you overcome unbelief. You can't just pray and fast you're going to have to also turn from those things that destroy you. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And somebody says, Well, I can watch all of this stuff. I can watch lying, stealing, adultery. I can watch things. I can sing country and western songs about, you know, crying in your beer and you're losing your dog and your everything else. And... And that doesn't bother me. You're deceived. There's some of you don't even know why you're depressed. It's because you sing depressing songs. You look at depressing movies. There's many of you that love horror movies when the scripture says God didn't give you a spirit of fear. What are you doing? You're feeding all of this stuff and then you're wondering, why am I bothered? Why am I afraid of stuff? Man, that's dumber than a bag of rocks. You need to unplug from this world. You can't be tempted with what you don't think. Quit thinking on things that minister unbelief to you and instead operate in prayer and a fasted lifestyle where you are unplugged from this world. Keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, Isaiah 26, 3, and he'll keep you in perfect peace. You heard Carrie talk about peace, how powerful peace is. You can't get peace by just praying for it. It says in 2, Corinthians, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 or 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Him that has called you to glory and virtue. Peace doesn't come by prayer. It comes by knowledge. You keep your mind stayed on the Lord and think about how much He loves you, and I guarantee you peace is going to be a result. Love will be a result. Your spirit man, where faith already dwells, will dominate you. And you can starve your doubt 
and your unbelief. I'm telling you, Jesus has already healed every one of us. Everything that we are believing for, you've already got it. You've got raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Now, are you going to believe it and act like it and praise God before you see it? Or are you going to wait until you feel something, until you can prove it to everybody else? I'm not saying that you deny that you have something. You know, when I had this thing on my ear, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want, I wasn't focused on it. But other people would see it and say, what's wrong? And I wouldn't sit there and say, I don't see anything. There isn't anything on my ear. I didn't deny that it exists. I just didn't focus on it. And I, I, di I denied that that was all that there was. Regardless of what I see in my body, I know who I am in the spirit. And that's what I believe. And that's what I'm going to walk in. And that's what I'm focused on. And if you can't see who I am in the spirit, if all you're doing is dealing with my flesh, that's your problem. Amen. Amen. And I promise you, the scripture says that if you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, you'll have perfect peace. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If all you do is think in, in, on the word, if all you do is see yourself healed, and if you do it without wavering in due season, you reap if you faint not. You have to believe you receive when you pray and you shall have it. It might be three seconds, shall have it, three minutes, three weeks, but really that's immaterial. Once you believe you've got it on the inside, it is just a matter of time until it manifests itself on the outside. And if you learn some things, you can speed it up. You can shorten the period of time in between when you say amen and there it is. But you can't get there any quicker than by starting that, to believe that you receive the moment you pray. And if there are some of you that are saying, well, I've been here all week and I hadn't received anything yet. That's your fault. I'm not saying that to condemn you, but I'm saying you got to understand that we've been trying to get it across that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. In your spirit, you're healthy. In your spirit, there is no sickness. There is no fear. There is no unbelief. In your spirit, you got the same faith that raised Christ from the dead. Now, are you going to operate in the spirit and operate by faith? Or are you going to operate by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel? It's your choice. Amen? Amen. It's really that simple. It's not that easy. But it is that simple. It's as simple as what I'm describing, but we have been trained. We've been plugged into the world so long. Some of you are going to go through withdrawals if you try and start walking by faith. Some of you, it's, you just don't know how to stay in the presence of God. I'm not saying that to hurt you. I'm saying it to help you. But honestly, you live in the natural realm. You, you go by your feelings. We have people today that are so controlled by feelings. People all of the time will say things like, well, I know that I'm supposed to love, but I don't feel it. Well, then your feelings are wrong. I've had people come up, would you please pray that God would just pour out his love in my life? No, I'm not going to pray that. Why would I insult God when he says that he's already commended his love toward us? And that you have on the inside of you love, joy, and peace. Now, if you come up and say, look, I know God loves me, but man, I'm not receiving it. I'm not feeling it. Well, then I could minister to you about, well, you need to refocus and put your attention on the Lord. And I could pray with you that your receiver would work, but I'm not going to blame God that his transmitter is not working. <laughs> God loves you. And if you don't feel love, well, then your feelings are wrong. Who cares what you feel? And yet the world is, well... I don't feel this. I had a woman that was graduate from our school and she brought me a tape and she was ministering to a young girl that this girl hated her parents, said that her parents were treating her terrible. And, and she said, I knew the parents and they weren't perfect parents, but they loved God and they loved her. And the things that she was upset was over was that they made her go to church. And that was child abuse. And so this girl just said, I, she was justified. And anyway, this woman said, I knew it wasn't true, but it didn't matter whether it was true or not. It was true to her. And so she taught the girl how to forgive her parents. I got so mad. I tore that. It was a cassette tape. I tore it into shreds and threw it out the window. 
I hate that. Well, what's wrong with that? It doesn't matter what truth is. It's what you feel. What you feel is more important than truth. That's idolatry. You're exhausted.